In this video, I'm going to finish showing you how we can get actual magnitudes of electric fields using Gauss's law in these highly symmetrical situations. Okay, so let's take them one situation at a time. The first one that we considered was an infinite plane. Okay, so we have charge spread out in this infinite plane. And because it's an infinite plane, there's also an infinite amount of charge, which is a little weird. So the way that we characterize the amount of charge is we say, okay, in some amount of area, there's a certain amount of charge. So we'll call this a surface charge density sigma. That's just a Greek letter. Don't get too distracted by that. Um, but that's the amount of charge per area. Okay. So if I want to find the amount of charge in a certain area, then I can rearrange that and get Q equals sigma times the area. And we will use that. Okay. So I have an electric field in the vicinity of this um, infinite plane. And by symmetry, I argued that the electric field should point directly upwards above, and it should point directly downwards below. OK. So in order to use Gauss's law to analyze the situation, what I want to do is draw a Gaussian surface, draw an imaginary surface where the electric field is either going directly through the surface, perpendicular to the surface, so that the area vector and the electric field are exactly the same direction or exactly opposite direction, and then in other places have the electric field be along the surface so that the flux is zero. Okay, there are a lot of choices you could make, but the one that I'm going to do is a cylinder. Okay, so imagine that I have a cylindrical surface like this, and it's going down through the plane. Okay, so some portion of this plane is going to be stuck within the um, cylinder. Like so. Okay, so there's my Gaussian surface. Okay, and to use Gauss's law in order to figure out something about the electric field, let me remind you what Gauss's law says. So it says for a closed surface, like this cylinder that I drew, the amount of flux is equal to the charge enclosed divided by some constant, epsilon naught. Okay, so in this case, the charge enclosed actually is going to just depend on the amount of area that is um, enclosed in this surface. So the amount of area of this charge density. Okay, so it's this. The amount of charge is just going to be the area where this circle is the area. This one is an area. This one is an area. It's a cylinder, so those are all the same. So the area times sigma and the flux then is that divided by epsilon naught. Okay, so that's what Gauss's law tells me. Um, and now I'm going to additionally calculate the flux directly from the definition of flux. The um, E, the electric field, times the area. Okay, so what does that look like? Well, I've got three parts. So my surface has three parts. I've got the flux through the top. I've got a flux through the side, the round curved side. And then finally, there's also a flux through the bottom. So if I add those all together, that gives me the total flux. Okay, it's just a scalar. I don't need to worry about doing anything more complicated than that. Okay, so let's look at each of these parts individually. So the flux through the top is the flux through this upper surface. The area vector, if I draw the area vector, is pointing directly upwards. 
okay? Pointing outward from the surface. Remember, that's the choice that we make. So the electric field is going to be whatever it is. That's what we're going to want to solve for. So we've got the electric field at the top times the area, okay? And because the electric field and the area are both pointing in the same direction, that's it. I don't have to worry about the angle. Cosine of zero degrees is one. All right. Next, we consider the flux through the side. Well, for the side, if I draw the electric field vector, it's this pink thing, and the area will point directly outwards. Okay, if I drew one there, or if I imagine drawing one over here, then it would look like this. Over here, it's going to point outward. Over here, it points outward. So um, in all directions, it points directly away from the axis of um, the cylinder I drew. Well, no matter which spot I consider, the electric field is always along that surface and the area vector is perpendicular to the surface. So that side has a flux of zero. Okay, and then finally we consider the flux through the bottom. Well, the area vector here points outward, which now is down. And the electric field also points down. So the um, flux through the bottom is E at the bottom times A, because um, it's the same area, and that's it. Now consider that the um, electric field at the top and at the bottom is the same. It's symmetrical. So we made the case that the amount of um, electric field has to be the same at some height um, above and below because I could flip the plane over and it looks exactly the same. So I'm just going to rewrite these e's, which are the same size as e, and now I've got 2e times a. That's my flux. Okay, so I'm going to set this flux equal to this flux. It's the same, I just figured it out two ways. So over here I use the definition of flux, and over here I use Gauss's law. So 2 times e times a gives me a times sigma over epsilon naught. All right, I've got a's on both sides, so what I'm going to do is cancel those, and I'm going to move the two over so I solve for e. So this gives me e equals sigma over 2 epsilon naught. Okay, so this is the electric field for a surface, a um, surface or a plane of charge. Okay, um, all we really did was use symmetry and then explicitly calculate the electric field by making a clever choice of Gaussian surface and then um, apply the, or equal, equate the flux to what we get from Gauss's law. Okay, now this actually looks really similar to one that we saw before, so I just want to briefly mention that. Um, and that case was the capacitor. Okay, so in the case of a capacitor, We had two parallel planes of charge, and we wanted to consider them to be basically infinite in extent. That's a convenient thing to do. So for this one, if I have, say, pluses on this plane, then the electric field from those is going to look like this. And over here, it'll look like this. Okay. And interestingly, the electric field that I came up with doesn't depend on the distance. So the electric field over here from that infinite plane of charge is also going to be in this direction. And it'll continue to be in that direction no matter how far away we go. Okay, so that's weird. Um, kind of weird, but also the plane is infinite, so maybe not so weird. Okay, well now on this one we had negative charges. Okay, so I'll draw those in magenta. Um, and because we know the electric field points towards negative charges, the electric field for the negative plane is going to point back towards it like this. Pointing towards the negative plane. Pointing towards the negative plane. And one of the things I want you to see here is that outside the two planes, these electric fields will cancel. So we'll get basically no field. But in between, they double. Okay, so if I calculate the electric field between, it's going to be sigma over 2 epsilon naught 
from the blue charges plus sigma over two epsilon naught from the magenta ones. So when I add those together, I get sigma over epsilon naught. So this is a half sigma over epsilon naught. There's another half and they add together the twos go away, which this is the one that I gave for a capacitor. So we have now shown that that's the case. Okay, so that is the first case, actually the trickiest case that we're going to solve this way. Now let's consider the other two situations that we looked at. Okay, so the other two highly symmetrical situations, well the first one, or I guess I should say the second one, is um, a line of charge or a charged rod. Okay, so for a charged rod, if I sketch that thing, we concluded based on symmetry that for an infinite charged rod, the electric field needs to look like this. So it needs to, um, oh, sorry, my thing is working a little weird. Okay, back to functioning. All right, um, the electric field points directly away from the rod. Okay, um, and it points in sort of radial directions. So it points away over here. And if I try to draw some kind of perspective electric field, it looks kind of like this. Okay, so always pointing directly away, um, the same at every height. Okay, so I'll just draw a couple more in here. Okay, so now I want to do the same idea. I want to come up with a Gaussian surface that is going to be either perpendicular or parallel to these electric fields everywhere. Okay, again, a cylinder does the trick. Okay, so I'm going to do a cylindrical Gaussian surface like this. Okay, so now, again, if I write out the flux for this thing, the, um, ooh, actually I should give you one more detail before I get to that. So along the charged rod, um, again, if it's infinitely long, we've got an infinite amount of charge, so that doesn't really make a lot of sense. So here we talk about a line density, lambda, which is the amount of charge per length. Okay, so if I have, say, a Coulomb per meter, that's a charge density. Um, and I can figure out how much charge I have based on how much of the rod I have. Okay, so if I rewrite this, Q equals lambda times L. Okay, <clears throat> so now we're ready. Um, if I have my surface having some length L, then that will be the only piece of information I need to know about it. Okay, so using Gauss's law, I have that the flux through the whole surface, this is again a closed surface that is enclosing some amount of charge, is going to be Q enclosed over epsilon naught. And here my Q enclosed is the charge density times the length over epsilon naught. Okay, and just like I did before, I'm going to add up all the parts. So based on just the definition of flux, I have the flux being equal to the flux through the top plus the flux through the curved side plus the flux through the bottom. Okay, this cylinder has three sides and if we add those all up, then we're set. All right, so now let's look at what the electric field is doing. So at the top, the electric field is pointing radially outward from the rod, but the area vector is pointing up so there's a 90 degree angle here between those. Okay, so this one, the flux to the top is just zero. And the same is true at the bottom. So I have my area vector pointing outward. Okay, and that's perpendicular to my electric field vector, so this one's also zero. Okay, so all that's left is the flux through the side in this case. And the flux through the side, well, I have area pointing radially outward and the electric field is pointing radially outward. So that means that this is going to be equal to just the electric field through the side times the area of the side. 
Okay, so if it's been a little while since you took geometry, you may not remember what the formula is for the area, the surface area of the side of a cylinder, but it's actually not that hard to figure out. So if you imagine that this is a can, maybe like just a, a can of beans or something, and it has a label on it, if you cut the label down the um, some spot on the side and then unpeel it, you just get a rectangle. Okay, and that rectangle is going to be so rewriting the electric field. Um, it's going to be the circumference of the can will be its length. So 2 times pi times r. That's the length of that rectangle. And the height will be the length of L. So I've drawn L here. OK. <clears throat> Oops, and this was supposed to be a times, not an equals. Sorry. OK. So this is it. My electric field through the side is going to be, um, well, sorry, my flux is the electric field through the side times 2 pi r times L. So again, I'm going to set these two fluxes equal to each other. Okay, so E is equal to, sorry, I keep doing this. Let me erase that. Okay. All right, E times, I'll get there, 2 pi r l equals lambda l over epsilon naught. Okay, so solving for e, the l's actually go away, and I end up with lambda over 2 pi r epsilon naught. Okay, and that's the formula for a rod. Okay, so that one actually does depend on distance. So r shows up here. The distance you are, you draw the surface away from the rod, determines the size of the electric field. So the electric field gets small as you move away. That makes sense. That's what we expect. And so this one, unlike the infinite plane, seems fairly reasonable. Okay. <clears throat> and again, this um, really relied on, oh my gosh, um, this really relied on using symmetry to um, describe what the electric field looked like before we started doing any drawing. Okay, so we had one last case that we can solve, and that is for a charged sphere. And this will actually work for any spherical, oops, um, any spherical distribution of charge that we have at all. Um, so it doesn't have to be just a solid sphere. It could be a spherical surface of charge, or it could be um, like really any distribution that is the same amount of charge at every radius. Okay, so I have some sphere Q, and I'll show it's a sphere with drawing an equator. And we argued that the electric field needs to point directly outward in every direction. Okay, so if I want to have a surface that has symmetry that matches the sphere, well, this time the choice is more straightforward. I'll choose another sphere. Okay, so the uh, electric field vectors are pointing directly outward at any point on the surface, and if I draw an area vector at any point on the surface, it's going to be in the same direction as the electric field vectors. Okay, so this time, if I use Gauss's law, then I get that the flux is equal to the charge enclosed. Well, that's just Q now. That's the charge of my sphere over epsilon naught. Okay, and also from the definition of flux, I get flux is equal to E times the surface area, which for a sphere is 4 pi r squared. Okay, so setting these two equal to each other, I get e times 4 pi r squared equals q over epsilon naught. Or, solving for e, I get 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught q over r squared. Which you've seen something like this before. If I call that first part k, this is k times q over r squared. 
Okay, so I made a claim that um, k is equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught when I first introduced epsilon naught. And now we can see how that comes apart, or how that comes about. Gauss's law gives us this connection between a spherical charge distribution, like a point charge, and um, k. So we see that there's this connection. So this is the form for a sphere. Okay, and that's it. We've now solved the electric field in three symmetrical cases just by using symmetry and Gauss's law. Um, hopefully this convinces you that making an argument based on symmetry really gives us a lot of power in trying to solve problems without having to do a whole lot of really difficult math.